You're on the phone. It is always a pleasure to welcome to this program Dave Zirin. He is the sports and politics writer for the nation. You can also uh, check him out at edgeofsports.com or follow him on Twitter at Edge of Sports. Welcome back, Dave. Hey, great to be here, Sam. So, Dave, uh, I primarily want to talk to you about uh, Marvin Miller, uh, who uh, just passed away. I also want to touch on uh, hockey because uh, Matt here in the office is a big hockey fan, and he's afraid he's not going to see any hockey at all this year, and I think he might be right. His fears are well-founded. Indeed. All right, well, let's start with Marvin Miller. Uh, who, who, Who was Marvin Miller? Sure, Marvin Miller passed away at 95. He was uh, just uh, the other day, and he's arguably uh, the most influential labor leader since World War II in the United States. He was the head of the Major League Baseball Players Association from 1966 to 1982, and he, he really brought a sense of unionism, solidarity, and, frankly, manhood uh, to the players of Major League Baseball. I mean, this was a union before he went there from working with the steel workers. That was an absolute tatters. Uh, the typical player uh, made between somewhere between six and seven thousand dollars a year. They had no freedom of movement. They had no freedom to play where they wanted to play. They had no freedom in terms of determining their their trainers, their doctors, safety. I mean, they really were treated uh, like chattel. I mean, you had a couple of decently paid players like Mickey Mantle was making a hundred thousand dollars a year. But the, but the average player, and by average, I mean the overwhelming majority of players, uh, took jobs in the off season, oftentimes working at a quarry or, or a typical manual labor just to make ends meet. Marvin Miller gets in there. He fights for workers' rights. He treats it like a real union. He fights for free agency. And because of all of this, during his tenure as head of the Major League Baseball Players Association, salaries went up astronomically. I mean, it, during his tenure alone, it went from the average salary being um, under $10,000 a year to being about $240,000 a year, and today it's over $3 million a year. But in addition to that, and this is far more important, he changed the sport for everyone. I mean, he made owners insanely rich, even though they despised him so much they kept him out of the Hall of Fame past his death. He still is not in the Hall of Fame, which is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, but he did more than that. I mean, any sense that we have now of sports as a big business, as sports is something that's expanded into most major cities in the country, as sports is a global entity, and any sense of competitive balance in sports is the result of Marvin Miller unshackling the ankles on the modern player bringing free agency, bringing freedom of movement, and actually opening up the eyes to people of how entertaining sports can be. So wait, so how did, and we should say, I mean, uh, you say that he helped the owners make the astronomical sums that they now make, too. What, where were they in terms of when, uh, when, when he became head of the union? Where were the owners at that point? I mean, the 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 gulf between I'm trying to get a sense of the gulf of between what the players were making and what the owners were making at that time, and then tell us how he ended up making the 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 owners uh, so rich. Well, because Marvin Miller grew the pie, and when Marvin Miller took over, you're talking about a split of owners' revenue to players' revenue that was overwhelmingly in favor of owners. I mean, we're talking like in some sports, and by the way, that is worth noting, is Marvin Miller's example influenced every single major sport, right. which is why there were uh, sentiments sent out yesterday from all of the major sports about his passing. But we're talking about 90-10 revenue shares. We're talking 85-15. We're talking about a situation where players were getting a pittance of what was a small pie. And owning a sports team tended to be a family business. It was something that you could buy for a couple hundred thousand dollars down. I mean, if you look back at what George Steinbrenner, for example, put down in his own money to buy the Yankees in the early 1970s, I mean, it's comically ridiculous how little money it took to actually buy into a major league franchise. And yet when Marvin Miller took it over, when Marvin Miller took over the union, uh, what he did was he worked on making sure that players would be able to go to different teams. This infuriated owners who saw players as little more than chattel. But by allowing players freedom of movement, it opened up the possibility of competitive balance in sports. 
And once you have competitive balance, you have fan interest. And once you have fan interest, uh, then, then the world is your oyster. Because all of a sudden, these owners who had these teams, which were kind of like, you know, Florida swampland that you had for decades, with the hope, to the hope that they would grow. I mean, the Yankees were losing money in the late 60s. Hmm. And then, so the hope was that, oh my gosh, if I hold on to this swampland someday, it'll be decent. You go from that to these being some of the most valuable properties in the world with insane returns uh, for their investors. Yeah, so let's also talk about, uh, you, you touched on this, but it seems to me that as baseball went, uh, we then saw uh, football and then ultimately uh, basketball and uh, perhaps to a certain extent uh, hockey as well. I mean, he, he his this whole notion that the players were no longer sort of like um, – you know, I'm like like baseball cards are to kids in some respects. You know uh, mm-hmm. that they um, they were actually there was actually a worker capital dynamic that was going on here, despite the fact that ultimately you know uh, players may make a, a lot of money, but you know those only ones that make it to to the major leagues. How did it also imp- implicate the the other the other sports? Hugely, hugely. And like I said, Billy Hunter, head of the NBA Players Association, as well as DeMora Smith of the NFL Players Association, both put out well wishes because uh, about after Miller's death that are incredibly heartfelt, and people should go online and read them uh, because they all get what Miller did. I mean, Miller, what he did was he, he ripped from the eyes of the players and from fans as well. Like he's seen often critically as someone who stole the innocence from fans. Well, boo-hoo. And he stole the innocence from players, boo-hoo, because what he did was he opened their eyes to the fact that you did have a labor capital dynamic in sports. That this wasn't the case of, hey, you're an adult playing a kid's game. You should feel, which was actually the approach even of George Meany, the head of the AFL-CIO, was he didn't take uh, baseball players or any athletes seriously as actual workers. And it was Marvin Miller who said, well, no, you're workers because you create wealth. Your workers, because your actions on that field are the engine of all the money that goes into this sport. And without you playing, there's no more money. Simple as that. No one's going to buy a ticket to watch somebody sit in an owner's box. And so under Marvin Miller's tenure, you have numerous work stoppages from 1966 to 1982. It earned him terrible um, enmity um, amongst the ownership ranks. And it's why, and this is just the ultimate slap in the face or bizarro world, or whatever you want to call it, Bowie Kuhn, the Major League Baseball commissioner, whose clock Marvin Miller cleans repeatedly in negotiations, is in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but Marvin Miller is not. Talk to me a little bit about the reserve clause and um, it, what, that, what that is and what, why, what the implications were of... Uh, was it Flood who had the uh, the yeah. brought up the case? Yeah, tell tell us about that. Yeah, and you can't tell the Marvin Miller story without telling the story of Kurt Flood and Marvin Miller, who I I interviewed several times the last time uh, when he was in his late eighties. Uh, he went out of his way to speak about Kurt Flood, who passed away in nineteen ninety nine. Um, I believe he was fifty six at the time. It was actually a very sad end to Kurt Flood's life. But without Kurt Flood, you don't get any of this. I mean, you got to look at it like if Marvin Miller was the engine, Kurt Flood was the steam running through the engine. The reserve clause was a part of baseball contracts going back uh, to the end of the 19th century. And what it did was it bound players to the team that originally signed them. And the only way you couldn't be on that team anymore is if you were traded or if the team threw you on the scrap heap and said, well, we don't, we don't demand, we don't want your services anymore. There was no sense that, like, you could sign a contract the contract could end, and then you could play somewhere else, or that you could demand a trade. I mean, that was just like unheard of, the idea of demanding a trade. And what Kurt Flood did was he said to Bowie Kuhn in a letter that I will no longer be a well-paid slave. And those words were, I mean, the, the opening shots for free agency. And Kurt Flood's case went all the way to the Supreme Court with Marvin Miller at his side, and Kurt Flood actually lost that case. And when Kurt Flood came back into Major League Baseball, and this was somebody who was a lifetime 290 hitter, he'd won a ton of gold gloves, he came back and played for the Washington Senators, and he was a pariah even in his own locker room. I mean, that's how out there he was seen. Like, even the other players didn't want anything to do with him. 
and he left the sport. But what it did, though, was it was one of those things where it opened up a discussion. Like Even in losing, Kurt Flug changed all of the dynamics that were going on in baseball in terms of how players saw themselves relative to owners. And then only a couple of years later, uh, you had Dave McNally and Andy Messersmith, and they became uh, the first players to actually win free agency. And once that happened, I mean, you see this explosion in salaries take place. And with the explosion in salaries, you also see this explosion of fan interest. And with the explosion in fan interest, you see expansion. And then you see all these things, which I think we're right to be very critical of with sports, which is like the size of the athletic industrial complex, its influence. Uh, these are, in a lot of ways, the, the ugly babies of Marvin Miller, like the fact like billions of dollars in public money going to stadiums. So it was really he who uh, really took the genie out of the bottle and said, like, look how huge this thing can be. How much did uh, like the the reaction to flood? I mean, it's sort of just it's uh, you know I don't know enough about the the, the history of, of baseball at that time. It just the reaction to flood sort of seems surprising to me, and I wonder if if mm-hmm. if, if, if it wasn't also wrapped up in what was happening uh, socially at that time. I mean, w- the, the, he filed suit in the late uh, '60s, early '70s. Yeah, that's right. It, it was baseball. It's got to understand is that baseball was the most conservative right. of all the sports that were going on right now. Players tended to come from the American South. Both white players and black players tended to come from the American South, and they tended to come from very small towns. Now, Kurt Flood was from Oakland, California. Now, Oakland in the late '60s was, of course, a hotbed, and and he was very much influenced by the 1960s by the black freedom struggle, by the civil rights movement, as Marvin Miller was as well. And so both Kurt Flood and Marvin Miller saw themselves as civil rights people. They saw themselves as the baseball version of what was happening in other sports, like Bill Russell in basketball, Muhammad Ali in boxing, Jim Brown in football. But what do all those sports have in common? They're not baseball. Right. And you would look, hard, you would look far and wide to find baseball players in the 60s who were part of this era of athletic revolt. Um, it just didn't happen. I mean, one player who was was Jim Bouton, the iconoclastic pitcher who wrote Ball Four. Um, I've talked with Jim Bouton about this and about efforts, for example, for of him to like enlist teammates in social issues. And it's just he, he, he could get nowhere. And it was very difficult. I mean, one of those reasons was there were, there were just fewer numbers of African-American players in baseball, and that meant less influence of the civil rights movements in baseball. But it was really also that it was a very conservative sport where players had very little social power. So why would you rock the boat in that context? And Kirk Flood found himself a pariah in the early 1970s. Now, today, a lot of players praise his name because they, they know what he did and what he sacrificed. But at the time, it was very, very difficult going for him. Yeah, I mean, it seems, I, I mean, it's hard for me not to imagine that there wasn't a certain amount of, I don't know if necessarily racism, but uh, at least to some degree. I mean, you have all these sort of social emancipation movements that are happening across uh, the the country. And uh, it is hard to imagine any other, you know, any sport more likely to perceive the dirty hippies as dirty hippies uh, than yeah. guys, you know, baseball guys. And Yeah, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's so funny because we, we, we always look back at 1972, that era. That was the era of Kurt Flood, was 1972. And that was, of course, also the year of you know, Nixon's silent majority, right. winning 49 states. I mean, so the, and then you also remember that year, you also had so much of the U.S. labor movement, the official movement, pulling away from the govern, right. which is why he only won one state. So then we ask ourselves the question, it's like, okay, uh, see so this country in 72 that both seems very radical, but also where Richard Nixon wins 49 states, where, where is Marvin Miller politically? Where is Kurt Flood politically? Well, they're with the one state. Those were their right. politics. And so you can imagine when you transplant that on as a conservative uh, element like a Major League Baseball locker room, uh, how difficult it was for Kurt Flood. He would have been a lot better off in a different sport, that's for sure. What do you think the uh, the chances now of uh, Miller ending up in uh, the, um, uh, the Hall of Fame? Oh, Marvin always said that they would elect him when he was dead. 
And he also always used the Groucho Marx line, well, I'd never want to belong to any club that would have someone like me as a member. Mm. So I think the chances are very good that as the the, the Veterans Committee, which would vote um, for Marvin Miller, like as they become comprised overwhelmingly of players who benefited from free agency, I think he gets in very easily. But honestly, like I, I'll repeat the words of what Reggie Jackson said yesterday. Like He said, like, look, or I think it was actually Joe Morgan who said this. He said, look, I, I don't care if he gets in now. I wouldn't have cared if he got in a year ago. He should have got in 30 years ago. Right. So we would have had 30 years to enjoy it with his family. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, I appreciate you talking to us about that. Now, give me a brief update for the sake of uh, Matt. I haven't been a hockey fan. <laughs> Uh, in probably, uh, I don't know, 30 years myself. But um, well, is he going to have any hockey? What's going on with the, with hockey? Uh, it's, it's, it's the revenge against Marvin Miller. <laughs> That's what's happening in hockey. I mean, you have a unified lockout strategy by ownership, something that would have been unheard of in Marvin Miller's time where they went on strikes, where they weren't locked out. And the problem, though, is that the owner's – are actually doing very well in hockey, yet a minority of them are doing very badly. So what you have is actually a battle between owners that are making money and owners that are losing money, and they're choosing to settle their own economic crisis on the backs of players by extracting salary back from them, which players had just given back a few years ago uh, when they adopted a hard cap and the entire season was canceled. So hockey's a disaster. They're trying to set a land speed record and how fast they can repel their fans fan base. Mm. And that's what happens, though, when, I mean, I think sports is way too beautiful uh, to, to put owners in charge of. <laughs> so that's part of the problem, is that when you put owners in charge of something like this, it's like King Midas in reverse. Anything they touch is turns to crap, and they are turning hockey to crap right now. It, it sort of feels like uh, the, the strength of labor in the context of sports is sort of uh, obviously paralleled, and there's, I guess there's no reason why it shouldn't, but... Um, that of um, uh, what we're seeing in in terms of the broader society, not necessarily it seems like on a on a dollars level, but oh, just in terms of the way that they perceive themselves in relationship to uh, to the owners and how 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 much unity there is, maybe. No, absolutely. I mean, since two thousand and ten, the number of lockouts in the United States uh, has doubled. It's a it's a product of. Uh, economic crisis and austerity, you know, and it used to be the third rail of labor management relations, the idea that you would just lock the doors and keep your workers out. And so many people who are now sports owners, uh, they're not like the old days where it was the family business handed down. Um, it's people who made billions of dollars in other industries, usually finance, who then buy a major, buy a major team, and they, they're only looking at bottom lines. They come from industries that are employing lockouts, and they see it as an effective tool because they win at the end when they get more money. Unfortunately, who that leaves out is not just players, but people like Matt. It's fans. It's people who work at the stadium. And it's, it's, it's a real tragedy, especially because, as we've seen in this era of public funding of stadiums, right. why do we really need owners again? I mean, the Green Bay Packers have shown that you don't actually need owners to have pro sports. And I think they should be very, very careful with how much they're, they're, they're pissing off their fan bases in all of these sports. I love it. Let's get rid of the owners. That's what I'm saying. All right. Dave hey, if Green Bay could win a Super Bowl that way, why, not, why isn't what's good for Green Bay good for America? Uh, I mean, uh, short of uh, maybe too much dairy products uh, in general, I would say, absolutely, uh, let's do it. Uh, Dave Zirin, uh, you can check him out at edgeofsports.com and, of course, uh, at The Nation magazine. Always a pleasure. Really appreciate you taking the time. My privilege. Our slogan should be not just lactose intolerant, but owner intolerant. <laughs> I love it.